Hi, everybody. My name is Darren Starr. I'm an astrologer, and I have been given the opportunity by Nadia Shaw to make a video on her YouTube channel, and it is such an honor to be here. I was very flattered to be reached out by Nadia, and when I first started studying astrology, she was one of the first YouTube astrologers I watch and learn from, amongst many others, like uh, Lada Don Shiva, uh, Chris Brennan, Ryan Kurzak, Victor Cara, and reading astrology books from authors like Stephen Forrest and Robert Hand. And I've been studying for a very, very long time. And I study and utilize all forms of astrology, like Western, Vedic, Hellenistic, evolutionary. You know, I can be more on the modern side or I can be you know, traditional sometimes, you know, I study anything and everything that pertains to astrology. And, um, you know, I'm pretty much a jack of all trades. And my career in astrology officially started uh, last year. I was discovered by Lada from the Astro Lada channel, and some of you may know her already. And I did a prediction for her. Um, I did a prediction on her pregnancy with her second child at the time when she was pregnant, of course. And I also did a reading for her husband, and she was very impressed with my analysis, and she hired me on onto her team. You know, so I'm one of her readers on her website now, and my life has, hasn't been the same ever since. And I probably did over 500 clients over the past year, and I don't have a lot of content out there of my own. You know, I have, you know, some interviews and videos here and there, but not a lot. Um, but I do plan to change that. I do plan to have my own website soon. I plan to make more videos. And, um, you know, a lot of people have been asking me to make more videos. So, you know, because I'm always so busy with clients, you know, I don't ever have the chance, but I do plan to, um, you know, step it up a little bit by making more videos. And um, so I wanted to talk to you guys um, about is one of my favorite ways to analyze and interpret birth charts is uh, using house rulers, and, or sometimes it could be called house lords. And um, so what is house lords? House lords is uh, basically there are planets that rule a zodiac sign. So for example, Leo rules the sun and um, the moon is ruled by Cancer and Mercury rules Gemini and Virgo and so on and so on from there. And um, uh, the way this works is that uh, when you're using the whole sign house system, which is a house system that I always use and it seems to work at least for me the best, and um, so whatever your rising sign is, that becomes the first house. And, um, and the zodiac signs go in sequential order after that. So it's one zodiac sign per house. And, um, you know, so I guess, for example, if you are a Scorpio rising, then uh, that would mean that Gemini sits in the eighth house and Virgo sits in the 11th house. So you would say that Mercury is the Lord of, or the ruler of the eighth and the 11th house. Or if you are a Libra rising person, then Venus uh, would rule the first house in the eighth because Venus is ruled by Taurus and Libra. So for a Libra rising person, Taurus would rule the eighth house. And I really like using house lords a lot. You know, I'm very uh, house oriented when I analyze a birth chart. And it can explain a lot to what's going on in the person's life. It could even show uh, physical, tangible results with house rulers. Or you can even see how the person is on a psychological personality level. And um, some people have empty houses. So it can, um, you know, so I think it's, so it can be really, really interesting um, to see um, the results of an empty house, like all you have to do is look at the ruling planet. So for example, if you have an empty seventh house and you want to know about relationships and there's no planets there, then yes, you can look at the zodiac sign, but 
you mainly want to look at the ruling planet and see what kind of aspects um, that planet has. So for example, um, a Capricorn rising person, Cancer would rule the seventh house and seventh house as a house of relationships and there's no planets there. So you can look at the ruling planet, which is the moon. So you would want to see the condition of the moon in order to know what the spouse may be like or even how you would meet the person. Or if you're concerned about your career and reputation, then you can look at the 10th house or the 6th house. You know, 6th house is a house of daily routines, work, service, and 10th house is about your reputation in society, career, authority, authoritative figures. And if those houses don't have any planets there, then you can look at uh, the ruling planet of those houses. So I just think it's a uh, really interesting, you know, to look at. And another interesting thing that um, I think at least you guys would be interested in is to show you the concept of rulerships and why the planets rule certain signs. Like why does Venus rule Taurus and Libra? Why does uh, Jupiter rule, rule Sagittarius and Pisces? You know, was it chosen randomly? Like, is there a pattern like, why does the moon rule cancer? Like, how did, astrolog how did ancient astrologers know to do that? So I am going to show you an image to, so to show you the logic and validity on why the planets rule certain signs. So uh, let me share the screen really quickly. So this here is an image of the, of the zodiac wheel and the planets, and you can see the placements of the planets under certain signs. And um, this part of it here is the northerly equinox, the celestial sunrise. So this is where uh, the sun starts to rise, you know, at the uh, northerly equinox, or um, some people call it the spring equinox. So this is the anchoring point of the zodiac. The anchoring point of the zodiac is uh, the equator, you know, which is the center of the earth, and it makes an intersection with the ecliptic, and the ecliptic is the, the, the annual path of the sun and the other planets. So when they cross each other, that becomes the, the beginning point or the cardinal direction of the beginning of the zodiac. So there's four waypoints. See, I have the northerly equinox, the northern solstice, the southerly equinox, and the southern solstice or it can be called the celestial ground, whatever you want to call it. So these are um, cardinal directions. So that's what makes signs like Aries and Cancer and Libra and Capricorn uh, cardinal zodiac signs. So that's what makes um, cardinal uh, signs um, be kind of uh, ambitious because it represents the beginning of, st of something. You know, to start something, uh, they're enterprising energies, they're action-oriented and um, constitutive, and basically they're initiating uh, pioneering energies, and then you can see the pattern on where, on where the modalities come from, you know, cardinal, fixed, and mutable. So then after the cardinal signs, you have the fixed signs, which would be Taurus and uh Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius, so fixed signs can be uh, unchanging, like it's an unchanging energy. Um, they can be quite stubborn and unyielding. And then the next modality after that would be the mutable signs because now it's leaving one segment, you know, getting ready to start a new segment, you know, like you have Gemini here, you know, it's part of one uh, quadrant and then it's getting ready to start another one, which would be the beginning of cancer the northern solstice this is the highest point uh in the sky so because sun and moon they're the king and queen of the zodiac you know they get to choose a certain zodiac sign because the zodiac signs is a division of space so it's going to take a certain area of that space so even though the king uh, would likely choose the highest point in the sky. But if you look at the elements of the signs, you know, you have air, 
uh, Gemini and then Cancer is water and sun is a hot, fiery planet, you know, so it's, it's a star really, but we say planet, but it's a hot, fiery, you know, illuminating ball basically. So it would likely choose a fire sign. So it's gonna choose the highest fire sign that there is, which would be Leo. And Leo is a fixed zodiac sign. So that's what makes Leos to be reliable, dependable, and authoritative. And Moon is the queen of the zodiac. So she's going to take uh, the highest portion of the sky. And she's naturally gonna gravitate towards uh, cancer because it's it's a water sign and it's the highest point in the sky and then after that according to the speed of the planet they get the first pick so mercury would get the next division of spaces which would be gemini and virgo next planet venus taurus and libra mars aries and scorpio jupiter pisces and sagittarius and saturn aquarius and capricorn so I'm sure some of you guys are wondering, well, what about the outer planets? So this is something that astrologers have been kind of debating about. You know, some people think that Uranus would be ruled by Aquarius. So it would take the next zodiac sign. And then uh, they've also said that Neptune would take Pisces and then Pluto would rule Scorpio. So the reason why people argue about this is because it kind of disrupts the order of things. Like you can see that there's an order here. There's a pattern here and it's pretty systematic. But once you get to the outer planets, you know, there's really no room or space for it. And, um, and it's even kind of weird. Like, you know, if Uranus were to take Aquarius and Neptune were to take Pisces, then it's kind of weird that it that Pluto wouldn't take on Aries. It jumps to Scorpio. So people go back and forth about this. Um, so to be honest, I really don't have an answer for that. Um, I like using the outer planets. You know, I analyze it. But as far as knowing if they rule signs or not, I honestly don't no, there's not really a clear answer on that. And people argue and debate about that too much. So it causes a lot of confusion. Like some people um, have strong opinions and convictions that the outer planets don't rule signs. And then it's the, and then it's the other way around. You know, some people have strong convic convictions and opinions that yes, Uranus does rule Aquarius and Neptune does rule Pisces and Pluto does rule uh, Scorpio. So people can be unyielding about it and people have these abstract ideas about it. And some of the ideas are weird. Like some people will say, well, maybe Neptune co-rules Pisces or maybe Jupiter co-rules Pisces or Mars co-rules Scorpio or Pluto co-rules Scorpio. So nobody seems to really agree on that. And for me, I stay on the safe side and just use the traditional ruling planets, but it doesn't mean that I'm dismissive of the outer planets. I do use them, but as of right now, I just use them as transits or I look at it in a flat surface way. You know, I analyze how an outer planet would behave in a certain zodiac sign in a certain house. And the outer planets can be a little bit more subtle in their results and more psychological, you know, sometimes the results of that of those planets don't really come into fruition unless um, it come it makes some kind of contact with the traditional planets. So that's something that I've noticed personally. Like when the outer planets make some kind of aspect to the traditional planets, then I kind of see the results of those outer planets. And, you know, just to entertain the idea that maybe the outer planets do rule signs, like if Uranus were to go here in Aquarius and Neptune were to be here in Pisces and Pluto and Scorpio, some astrologers speculate that maybe there's 12 planets. Maybe the next planet that will be discovered would take on Libra or something. And the next planet could take on either Gemini or Virgo or something like that. You know, it could take on the next segment. So there's all kinds of uh, ideas and, um, you know, philosophies on stuff like that, on why the planets rule the signs. But uh, this right here, it does show 
the logic and validity in the traditional ruling planets. And, um, but I am open-minded to entertaining the idea of outer planets ruling science too, you know? So it's just something that's in the back of my mind, but I don't really use it in my analysis with clients yet because I'm not fully comfortable with it yet. So that's just me personally. And so before you start analyzing house lords, you want to know the dignity of the planet, you know, so when a planet is in its own sign, obviously the planets are going to do well. And then there's uh, exaltations and debilitations, you know, so like Mars would be exalted in Capricorn, Saturn would be exalted in Libra and so on and so on. So, um, you know, I'm assuming that you guys are pretty advanced in astrology, so I probably don't need to go into that. And um, you can also see uh, why the signs have the elements that they do. Like Aries, for example, you know, this is when the sun be, uh, begins to rise. You know, this is where it makes the celestial sunrise. So the sun will be going above the equator. So this is uh, the root of light and fire. So that's what makes uh, Aries a, a fiery zodiac sign. And Aries is anchored to the east, so the east is the uh, east is correlated to fire and light, and uh, so that's what makes uh, that's what makes Aries the root of the fiery element. And so the celestial ground, you know, which is uh, Capricorn. So because it's celestial ground, that's what makes uh, Capricorn the the root of Earth signs, and then uh, Libra would be. Uh, the root of air signs, and then uh, cancer would take, uh, would be the root of water signs. And then they try and aspect each other after that. So Aries trying Leo and Sagittarius, Taurus to Virgo and Capricorn, and so on and so on. So you can see a lot of patterns uh, with this wheel here. So now I'm gonna give you examples on, uh, on people that I know, um, some clients that I have, and a couple of celebrities on how rulerships work and how you can use them uh, with transits and stuff like that. So I'm gonna show you the first example. So this chart right here uh, is, a, is a person that I did a reading for last year, and this person is married. And the person um, was trying to have a child you know, uh, last year, for the last uh, couple years, actually. And um, they were trying, and the person wasn't getting pregnant for some reason. And I told her that you probably would get pregnant in 2019, and she's, and that did happen. She's actually pregnant right now. So the way I came to that conclusion is, uh, you know, I looked at the fifth house. You know, fifth house is a house of children. So she doesn't have any planets there. So I would look at the ruling planet, which would be Venus. And she has Venus in the 12th house. So there's no uh, difficult aspects with Venus. Um, you know, 12th house is a house of losses, like energy being lost, but um, the person is not doomed, or at least that's what I told the person, because the person was kind of worried, you know, if there was any complications on her body on why she wasn't getting pregnant. And um, the fifth house, in the fifth house ruler, is not the only thing you look at for children. You know, you want to look at Jupiter, because Jupiter represents fertility in children. And her Jupiter is exalted in Cancer, so that's a good sign. Um, the aspects are a little challenging. You know, she has a square aspect, and then she has oppositions from Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, and Saturn can put a delay on things, so a delay in um, fertility and stuff like that. And so, but just looking at Venus, you know, Venus rules Taurus and Libra. And um, the reason why I told her that she would get pregnant in 2019 is because um, her Venus is in Sagittarius. And looking at the transits for 2019, Jupiter would transit over her Venus. So let me um, turn on the transits. So uh, the outer planets are on the outside, which is the green parts right here. And so Jupiter is uh, conjuncting her natal Venus. 
So Jupiter is a planet of luck and blessings. So um, right when Jupiter made contact with her Venus is the time that she got pregnant. So uh, let me make sure, because she did tell me the month she got pregnant. Yeah, it was March 2019. So yeah. Okay, so yeah, so around March, that was around the time that conception happened and that is when uh, she got pregnant. And uh, when it comes to children and pregnancy, it could be really, really difficult. So this is not the only thing you wanna pay attention to, you know, at least for me, I always use uh, several different techniques. Like I use annual pro perfections, I look at progressions, I look at solar returns. So all of those things have to come into play. It can't be just dependent on this one transit alone. So, um, but I'm not gonna get into any of that. I just wanted to show you a quick example on how house, uh, house lords uh, work. You know, Venus is the Lord of the 10th house and fifth house. And when Jupiter made a conjunction and activated not only the planet and the house that it's in, but also the houses that, um, Venus rules. So when Jupiter made a conjunction to Venus, it activated her 10th house and her 5th house. You know, 5th house is the house of children. That is when she got pregnant. And I also have this person's uh, husband's chart. So let me pull up the husband's chart. This is another interesting thing. So interestingly enough, his fifth house is Libra, which is also ruled by Venus. And his Venus is also in Sagittarius. So even for him, you could see that um, a child would, you know, come about in the year of 2019. See how Ju Jupiter is in Sagittarius and so is Venus, uh, the same as his wife. So they both have Venus in Sagittarius and even though they're different ascendants, but their fifth house has a uh, Libra and Taurus, which both signs are ruled by Venus. So that is why it was likely that they would uh, have a child, you know, in this year. So they're currently expecting a girl. So that's good news for them. And uh, let me show you guys another example on how rulerships work. Uh, So this person here has, I think, about maybe five or six kids, but I don't remember exactly. But this person has a lot of children, basically. So this person has uh, Virgo ruling their fifth house. And uh, Virgo is ruled by the planet Mercury. So you would want to know the conditions of Mercury. And his Mercury is in the fourth house of Leo. And so why would this person... Um, have uh, so many children. Well, the reason why this person has a lot of children is because Mercury is receiving an opposition from Jupiter. Jupiter is expansion, Jupiter is fertility, it's aspecting Mercury, so it's aspecting the Lord of his fifth house. So that is why it is likely that this person would have a lot of children. So even though he has nothing in his fifth house, it doesn't mean that that the fifth house won't be activated or it's not, um, you know, that aspect of his life uh, is not relevant. It's completely relevant because of the ruling planet and the aspects that it's receiving. It's a lot of challenging ones, you know, so I don't know him personally, but I can see that there may be some uh, difficulties or it could be stressful, you know, it has a Saturn square aspect too, so maybe it's, uh, a lot of responsibility on him, you know, to raise um, so many children, you know, in modern day age. So let me show you guys another example. So this person, uh, where is that person? Okay, this person uh, comes from a family of, uh, uh, nurses, I believe. I don't remember exactly, but they're basically all in the uh, health field. 
and also the person uh, married a foreigner and the and his wife is also in the medical field so why would this happen for him so he has his seventh house is Aries and Aries is ruled by Mars and so um, his Mars is in Virgo in the 12th house. So 12th house is a house of hospitals or foreign lands, um, isolated areas. So his wife is a foreigner and Virgo is one of those healing signs. So when you interpret this, you know, it's, you could say that the person, you know, could be skillful in anything regarding, uh, cause I think the person is in surgical tech and Mars rules, you know, weapons, knives, cutting, you know, 12 houses, a house of uh, isolated areas or hospitals. And Virgo is one of those meticulous uh, healing signs. So his wife is a, uh, is in surgical tech and she even has a foreign uh, speech. Like she speaks different languages. And the reason why that is, is because uh, Venus which represents the wife, you know, love and relationships. Uh, it's in conjunction with Mercury. And Mercury is the Lord of, or the ruler of the 12th house and the ninth house, Gemini and Virgo. And, the, and what the 12th house and ninth house have in common is uh, they both uh, represent foreign areas. Like ninth house is foreign travels. Uh, 12th house is more about foreign lands. And just being there and experiencing um, being in an isolated area and ninth house is more for the sake of traveling, but also different religious backgrounds, culture. So when you have the Lord of the 12th and the ninth in conjunction with Venus, which represents the wife, there's some indication that there's something foreign about the person. And on top of that, this person has the seventh house ruler in the 12th house. 12 houses of foreign land so there's lots of indication that yes he would likely marry somebody foreign you know and then venus and cancer cancer is another sign of healing and nurturing and caring and even his parents you know were in the medical field i believe or his mother is you know he you know cancer is ruled by the moon and moon represents mother so you got the 10th house ruler in the fourth and the fourth is Capricorn, and the fourth house ruler is in the 10th. And uh, the moon is receiving some difficult aspects. So he did say that, you know, his mother was a workaholic and was kind of distant and um, kind of stressed out because she was always at work, you know, working in hospitals. So you see that his moon is receiving, you know, some challenging aspects, but it does make a lot of sense as to why. Um, he would come from a family that worked in the medical field and also having a wife that was foreign and also worked in the uh, healing profession. So the next example I want to give you guys is a celebrity. Uh, now, some of you guys may recognize this chart. This is the chart of Prince Harry. So... I wanted to show this one as an example because uh, you can kind of see uh, patterns on, as to why he had he would be drawn to the kind of wife that he has now, which is Meghan Markle. So his seventh house is Cancer, no planets there, and Meghan Markle is about three years older than him, and in his chart it does show that he probably would get married later in life, you know, in his mid thirties. And he did, you know, I think he got married around 34. And the reason why that is, is because cancer is ruled by the moon. So you would want to look at the condition of the moon and what kind of aspects it's receiving. So moon is being aspected by Saturn and Saturn is a planet of delays and uh, maturity and age. So yes, uh, maybe somebody who's older getting married uh, later on in life, you know, not necessarily in his 20s. And um, Saturn also, uh, when Saturn is involved with the seventh house Lord, 
um, sometimes it just puts an age gap. Not, it doesn't always mean like an older person. Sometimes a person can be significantly younger. But in his case, she is older. And she even has a Saturnian look. You know, the Saturnian look, you know, can be uh, a person that has significant bone structure, like high cheekbones. Because Saturn does rule bones, it's also ruled by the color black. So in comparison to, to him, you know, she the skin tone is darker, you know, darker than him. And, uh, and it's Saturn is aspecting the moon, which is the lord of the seventh house, which is the house of relationships and spouse. So that is why um, he lucked up with somebody like her. And even in her chart, let me see, let's see, Megan, yeah, Megan Markle. Even in her own physical features, yes, she has Mars in the first house, and she is a Cancer rising, which is interesting because in, uh, in uh, the princess chart, his seventh house is Cancer, so he would naturally gravitate to somebody with Cancer qualities. And uh, her ascendant ruler, which is the moon, is in conjunction with Saturn. So she herself has a Saturnian look, you know, slender, high cheekbones. Uh, it's also in the sign of Libra, so she's very attractive. And I forgot to mention in the Prince Harry's chart, his Venus is in Libra, and she has a stellium in Libra. So she, uh, so even in his chart, it kind of just very descriptive on what kind of person she would be like. So there's all kinds of clues when it comes to house rulers and stuff like that. You can get an idea on what your life will be like. Like if you want to know uh, what your financial situation is like, you know, on a basic level by looking at the second house, the 11th house, the eighth house, um, what's going on with Venus, you know, and what house it rules and where Venus is, uh, stuff like that. And your if you want to know what basically the thing of your life would be like, you would, you know, look at the ascendant, you know, is your ascendant ruler in the 10th house, the ninth house, you know, or if you're concerned about uh, your living situation, because um, fourth house is represents your, your emotional happiness and property and land. So if a person were to have the fourth house ruler in the 12th, for example, then maybe you would be a lot happier in a foreign place rather than uh, the city that you grew up in, you know, but that's just a simple analysis. There has to be way more indications uh, than just that one simple thing. Okay, and another example I wanna give is, uh, let's see, Martin Luther King. So I think this one is interesting is because uh, he has moon in Pisces in the 11th. You know, and Moon is ruled by Cancer, the third house. And third house is about speaking, communication, so, and uh, courage and uh, self-efforts. So he has the rule of the third and the 11th, which is the house of, it's one of those humanitarian houses and uh, large network circles and society. And um, he was best known for, for his I Have a Dream speech. And Pisces rules dreams. You know, Pisces has uh, that kind of intelligence that is uh, spiritual and loving. And he has a conjunction with Venus, so uh, his mind is very, very pleasant and harmonious because Venus is a sign of beauty and uh, Moon represents the mind. So beautiful thoughts of how humanity should be. So yeah, he was an activist, you know, best known for, for his I Have a Dream speech and uh, being a spokesperson. He was a leader for the civil rights movement and, you know, all about for, uh, uh, you know, speaking about uh, racial inequalities. And he also has the ruler of the six and the 11. So uh, Venus is ruled by the first and uh, the sixth house. So pretty much the theme of his life would be about people and society. And also because Venus is ruled by Libra, the sixth house. Sixth house is a house of 
issues, you know, how you solve problems. So the way he will solve problems is being uh, uh, very diplomatic and um, loving in nature and forgiving, you know, because Pisces is very forgiving and also um, expressing, um, you know, expressing that kind of wisdom and knowledge about uh, equality amongst uh, society and groups of people and pretty much expressing his uh, spiritual and philosophical uh, viewpoints. And there's other little things too, like he has uh, Leo ruling his fourth house. And even though Leo's ruled by the sun, uh, which sun represents father, but fourth house is a house of motherhood. Um, so it's it can be tricky sometimes, you know, if you wanna know about things uh, pertaining to parents, but he has the rule of the fourth house in the ninth house and ninth house represents, uh, it's a house of religion and philosophy. And his father was a minister, you know, son is father, ninth house is teaching, you know, religion, being a minister. And um, son is ruled by not only Leo, Leo rules the fourth house, which is mother and uh, Ninth House is teaching, and his mother was a teacher. So um, you can find out a lot of different things uh, using house uh, rulerships, you know, with uh, using transits. And uh, so even when it comes to transits, not only will that transit impact the house and the planet, but also the house that the planet rules. So if a planet were to come into his Ninth House um, and it gets close to the sun, it can activate uh, the fourth house as well because sun is ruled by Leo. So anyways, guys, uh, I didn't wanna make the video uh, super duper lengthy. So those are all the uh, real life examples that I have. Uh, I mean, I have a lot more, but again, I don't wanna make the video uh, super long. Um, but basically, you know, when you're using whole sign houses and you want to know about certain things in your life, and uh, especially the empty houses, you know, because a lot of people ask questions about the empty houses and, you know, what does that mean? Then you can just look at that ruling planet and see um, uh, how that part of your life is being impacted. And even the planets that are not empty, like if you have like four planets, you know, in the 10th, then you want to look at those planets and see which sign that they rule and you can do other it, it'll help you understand uh your life a little bit too like for a leo rising person if you want to know about your financial situation then you would want to look at mercury because mercury rules uh Gemini and Virgo, which uh, sit in the 11th and 2nd house, and 11th house is uh, tangible gains and earnings, and 2nd uh, house is about hoarding uh, wealth, you know, or if um, another good example is uh, why would Aquarius would, would be educated in occult science? Well, again, Mercury rules uh, the 5th and the 8th. You know, Virgo sits in the eighth, Gemini sits in the fifth, and fifth house is a house of intellect and education, and eighth house is occult science or other people's money. So Aquarius does have that potential to be really smart and savvy when it comes to uh, occult knowledge, occult science, or earning money from other people. And um, what's another good example? Oh, you know what? I actually do have a, an interesting, funny story. This person is a Pisces rising. And so Mercury rules the seventh house for this person, the seventh house and the fourth house. And this person's uh, Mercury's in Virgo. Now, you would think that, you know, Mercury's doing well in the seventh house in Virgo. It's in its own sign. It does, Mercury does well in the seventh house. But this person's Mercury has a lot of difficult aspects. And so Mercury and Virgo, you know, the person attracts uh, people who are very critical of, of him, you know, women who are very critical of him. And he attracts people like his mother. He complains about that a lot. Like, 
because he because it rules his fourth house too. So when the rule of the fourth is in the seventh, then there's usually a possibility that the mother is pretty much in your marital business. So in his case, his his mother was very very critical of the woman that he chose, and she is very critical of his wife. But he laughs at himself because he thinks that his mother and his wife are just alike. They're exactly alike. They nitpick each other. They criticize each other. They this Virgo is a flaw finding zodiac sign. So that's more of the uh, darker sides of uh, Virgo to be critical, you know. But it only happened in a negative light for him because of the challenging aspects. You know, he had a Pluto conjunction and square aspects from Neptune and Jupiter square and Mars involved. It was just a lot. It was a lot going on with that Mercury. So that's how it played out for him. So, yeah, um, anyways, you know, when you're interpreting um, a planet in a certain house or using uh, house rulerships and house lords, um, you know, when it comes to interpretations, what you want to think about is what the planet means and think about what the sign means and what the house means and think about the dignity of the planet, too. You know, that way you can give it, you know, points you know you can grade the planet you know is it in its own sign is it debilitated is it in an okay sign is it in a good house you know like for example mars and saturn they do well in the sixth house saturn also does well in the 12th the sun does good in the 10th and the 9th and um but if it's debilitated like if sun is in the 10th house but it's in libra the thing you're going to get mixed results because sun is debilitated in Libra, but it likes to be in the 10th house. And then you want to think about the house that it rules. So that's Capricorn rising. So sun rules the eighth house. So something to do with transformations or sudden events could have an impact um, in the 10th house or the person's career. And then you also want to keep going with that too. They call that the depositor. So like the, Libra sun person, if Venus is in good dignity, then um, you can have a decent relationship with authoritative figures or having a pleasant relationship with the fatherly figure because sun represents father. So even when it comes to parents too, because uh, sometimes our sun signs and moon signs, it sometimes it doesn't really match what we think uh, or how we perceive our parents to be, but a lot of the times that ruling planet will be very revealing. So like if somebody's moon is in Virgo and, you know, the person, the person's mother doesn't really have a lot of Virgo qualities, then, but if the person's uh, Mercury is in Scorpio, then maybe the, the person's mother has uh, Scorpionic ways. Like maybe the mother was really secretive or intense, or maybe a mother who's a psychologist or something like that. So you want to pay attention to those things, you know. Don't just look at a planet in a sign in a house, think about what it rules, and then think about the depositor. Or if somebody has moon and Aries in the 10th house, then you want to look at Mars too and see what that's doing. And, um, you know, just keep going along with that you know, and uh, see how it works out for you. So um, I hope that this video was uh, interesting and I hope you guys learned something uh, from this video. And again, I want to thank Nadia Shah for allowing me to be on her channel. And I'm super, super grateful. So uh, thank you, Nadia Shah, and um, thank you guys. So I'll see you guys later. Bye.